Hi, I'm Lisa Williamson, and we're looking at BC Lower Mainland Pony Club Education Series. This is number two in the series on equine nutrition, and we'll be looking at the equine digestive system. First, it's important to understand what nutrition is. So, good nutrition is the cornerstone of a healthy horse, and nutrition is defined as the selection, preparation, and ingestion of food to be used by the body. The function of the digestive system is to take in this food, break it down into small enough components that the body can then extract the various nutrients required for utilization. So the horse is going to be taking food, turning it into nutrition so that they can do exercise, etc. The digestive system starts at the incisors, so in the mouth, and works its way all through the horse right out to the end where it comes out at the anus, that is the final part of the digestive system. It's basically a tube that runs through the horse's body. It's got a number of different names, so we'll call it the digestive system, but it's also known as the alimentary canal, the digestive tract, or the gastrointestinal tract, which you'll often see abbreviated as GI tract. The complete GI tract, or digestive system, starts at the mouth, proceeds to the pharynx, down the esophagus, into the stomach, then goes into the small intestine and the large intestine. And there we have a picture of the different parts. Some of them in the top left are separated, so you can see them, and then all of them are on the bottom right in their position. One thing to note is that the stomach is suspended within the system. There's no contact with the body wall, and this is part of the reason why the horse cannot vomit. There are other associated organs that are part of the digestive system, and those include the teeth, the tongue, the salivary glands, the liver, and the pancreas. In the teeth, we're looking at the horse having 12 incisors and 24 molars, and the role of the incisors is to grab the food and move it into the horse's mouth. With the aid of the tongue, the food gets moved back to the molars, where the food is then subject to grinding, so there's a mechanical digestion. And at that time, the salivary gland, saliva, and other digestive enzymes are added, and chemical digestion starts to take place. The lips start the process, and they are highly mobile and capable of relatively complex tasks like opening stall doors or sifting a preferred food from a less preferred food. They draw the food into the mouth. Again, we have the teeth, which are the incisors. Their role is to cut and tear the food, so cut the grass, scoop the grain into the mouth, tear the hay out of the flake of hay. Then the molars are the introduction of mechanical digestion. Horses chew at a rate of 70 to 90 rotations per minute. Ponies chew at a higher rate. As horses age, more structural substances in the teeth are exposed, and this helps with chewing. The horse's upper jaw is slightly wider than the lower jaw, and that means that the teeth do not wear evenly. So you need to make sure that your horse has regular dental checkups to make sure that his digestive health is good. Uh, one problem that horses will get digestive-wise is teeth-related problems, and this can impact their digestion severely, especially as the horse ages. So the initial parts of the, di the digestive tract are the tongue, which acts basically as a conveyor belt. Uh, food is formed into a bolus or a ball in preparation for swallowing. When the horse drinks water, which is also an important part of digestion, the tongue is used in a similar manner as to how a human uses a drinking straw. And so they curl the tongue and they draw water up their tongue and swallow it. So the tongue also aids in mixing food with saliva, and that aids in chemical digestion. The salivary glands uh, produce, uh, saliva is produced as a direct result of chewing, and saliva is secreted by three pairs of salivary glands. The first is a parotid, which is found under the base of the ear. Then there's the sublingual, found under the tongue, and then the mandibular, which is found at the back of the jawbone or the mandible. Very acidic chemicals are introduced at this time. They help to convert starch. Also early in the digestive system is the soft palate that separates a nasal cavity from the back of the mouth. And when the soft palate comes into contact with the food bolus, it lifts, and this triggers a reaction. The windpipe is closed. The windpipe is also known as a trachea, so that food does not go into the lungs. And then that, in turn, allows a bolus of food to pass through into the esophagus. The pharynx is the access portal to the esophagus. Now, the esophagus is a four-foot long tube, that's 1.3 meters on the average size horse, 
it has something called one-way peristalsis. And so peristalsis are the muscular contractions that allow food to get moved along the system. And this is a very important thing we'll come into, or we'll see peristalsis again later when we get into the intestinal tract. One-way peristalsis found in the esophagus is another reason why horses cannot vomit. There's no muscular contractions that can move the food from the stomach to the mouth. Food can only be moved from the mouth into the stomach. The food bolus flows along the esophagus with the aid of saliva and with the aid of peristalsis. And then there's something called the pyloric sphincter which is where the esophagus meets the stomach. And it's designed to, again, stop food from moving out of the stomach into the esophagus. So yet another reason why horses are unable to vomit. So looking at this, this is the components of the digestive system. And we have all the components there. Comparison with the cow. The cow has uh, its most important digestive structures near the front. You've probably heard that a cow has four stomachs. What they've done with the horse in its design is all the important digestive structures are at the back of the system. And this actually is one of the things that allows the horse to run and run far and run fast. By the time food gets back there, it's already broken up. And so it is something that allows the horse to be a lot more mobile if you put the horse in comparison to a cow. Okay, so looking at the stomach now, that's the next part of the digestive system. After we leave the esophagus, we are at the stomach. And the stomach has about an 8 liter capacity. And there are two main parts to the stomach, and which are separated by something called the margo plicatus. There's the squamous or non-glandular part of the stomach, which is at the top. There's no protective mucus, and the pH is higher in this area. The bottom two-thirds of the stomach is called the glandular portion of the stomach, and the pH is 1.5 to 2. This is where hydrochloric acid is produced. Uh, the digestive enzyme pepsin is introduced, and that whole part of the stomach, the bottom two-thirds, is protected by a mucus layer. That's very important when you are thinking about the rule, eat little up to often, and the problem that some horses have called ulcers. We'll talk more about that later. So there are some enzymes that are present in the stomach. So the three primary enzymes in the stomach are pepsin, and its role is to break down protein into a more accessible form. Then there's renin, and it is primarily used to coagulate milk when drunk by foals. And so again, if you have an adult, horse, then that will not be utilized so much. And lipase starts the breakdown of fats. So here we have the horse's stomach, and you can see the division into the two sections. The top section is non-glandular, has a higher pH, no protective mucus. And so again, if your horse is going to get ulcers, likely it will be in the top part. Uh, these two distinct sections are separated by the margo plicatus, and that's just the division between the protected and unprotected sections of the stomach. The lower section is glandular, again has a pH of 1.5 to 2.5. This is where hydrochloric acid is produced, and it is coated with that protective mucus. And again, it's suspended inside the body cavity, and this does not allow for vomiting. If you're looking at accessing nutrients, the initial parts of the digestive tract from the mouth to the stomach are primarily responsible for mechanical and chemical digestion. And this breaks down nutrients into accessible components and is referred to as enzymatic digestion. And the latter part of the digestive tract, small and large intestine, are primarily responsible for absorption of the nutrients. The nutrients are further broken down with the aid of microorganisms present in the hindgut. And this is referred to as bacterial digestion. So the nutrients are absorbed through the walls of the small and large intestine, and they pass into the bloodstream where they're distributed around the body by the circulatory system. So before, they, before we leave the stomach area, you just need to note relatively how small it is compared to the rest of the digestive system. Uh, the horse has the second smallest stomach of any farm animal, and this is again going to one of your rules of feeding, feed little and often, why it is very important that you do not feed uh, big meals all at one time because the horse's stomach is so small. So now we're going to move into the larger parts of the intestinal tract. So. The first part that we just left is called the foregut. So again, that uh, is the stomach. The foregut also includes the small intestine, and that's where enzymatic digestion takes place. But the hindgut is 
what we're coming up to soon, and that is where something called microbial digestion takes place. So the small intestine is a long, narrow tube that is 25 meters long. Uh, it's basically loosely arranged in the horse's abdominal cavity, uh, fairly unorganized. It takes up 75% of the gastrointestinal tract in length, so it's very, very long. Although it's called small intestine, it is actually the longest part of the intestine. But why it is called small intestine is because it's not very big in volume, so it's only about 30% of the gastrointestinal tract in volume. The tube is fairly narrow. Think about a pool noodle and you're looking at something maybe that size, maybe a little bit smaller. Much longer though than a pool noodle. So the small intestine is the site of nutrient absorption and that's very important. Proteins are absorbed here, fats, soluble carbohydrates and minerals all absorbed in the small intestine. The small intestine is divided into three parts. Uh, the first two here is the duodenum which has a pH of 2.5 to 3.5 and uh, it helps to neutralize the digestion. Remember there's been a lot of acids dumped into that food in the stomach to start with the breakdown and so the first part of the small intestine helps to neutralize things before it moves along the passage any further. So digestive enzymes from the pancreas, intestinal glands and bile from the liver are all added here. What bile does is it emulsifies fats and oils and it also helps to neutralize the effect of acids by making the environment more alkaline. Bicarbonate is also secreted as a buffering agent. Again, this helps with the acids. And then insulin is found here as well. The second part of the small intestine is the jejunum. And this is where the primary absorption of nutrients that are digested by enzymatic digestion occurs. So starches, proteins, fats, all get absorbed in this area. And then the final part of the small intestine is the ileum and this is where the absorption of minerals and vitamins takes place. So primarily calcium, phosphorus, the B vitamins and the fat soluble vitamins. Again, thinking about the pH balance in the system, it's important that the pH is neutral before it reaches the large intestine. This is going to facilitate transportation across cell walls and it will give optimal activity of enzymes to break down feed into the different constituents. So amylase is going to get degraded into starch and lipase will be degraded uh, or degrades lipids. Amylase degrades starch and lipase degrades lipids. So a few more things about the small intestine before we move on. The rate of passage of the digesta through the small intestine is between 45 minutes to 2 hours. Compare that to the stomach. Food typically stays in the stomach about 15 to 20 minutes. So Again, feed little and often because food will not stay in the stomach very long. It will not be exposed to the chemicals. Uh, it's going to get pushed through into the small intestine. But even with the small intestine, food will only stay in here 45 minutes to 2 hours. Peristalsis moves food via waves of muscular contractions. So the food is always moving through. There's muscular contractions happening all the time. Another thing that's important is the horse does not have a gallbladder. The horse in spite of this, still has the ability to digest fat and secrete bile. We're going to look again at a comparison between the foregut and the hindgut. Foregut again is everything from the mouth to the small intestine. This is the site of digestion and absorption of all the available carbohydrates and 60 per 70 to 70 percent of the crude protein. This is where enzymatic digestion takes place and we've got vitamins and minerals being absorbed at this point as well. Compare that to the hindgut, which we are going to come and read about a little bit more, see about more. And the hindgut is primarily composed of the large intestine, which is everything from the cecum to the anus. And it is a principal site of raw digestion, which is also known as microbial digestion. So we'll learn a little bit more about that shortly. So here we have the digestive tract taken out of a horse. On the left is the small intestine. And again, you can see the diameter of the intestinal uh, the diameter of the intestines is much, much smaller, narrow tubes, about 70 feet long. On the right, we have the cecum and the large intestine, very large diameter. The length is only about 21 feet long, so much shorter than the large intestine, but much greater volume. So the large intestine, also known as the hindgut, is where food passes 
from the small intestine through the ileocecal valve and then it enters the large intestine which ha is about 7 meters long and has a capacity of about 150 liters. It comprises 60% of the volume of the gastrointestinal tract. It's a large tube that doubles back on, its, on itself and that unfortunately makes this a common site for certain colics, impaction colic, etc. The digestive stays in the large intestine for about 24 hours. So again, it moves through the stomach very quickly, 15 to 20 minutes, through the small intestine fairly, fairly quickly, 45 minutes to two hours, and then it goes and it sits in the large intestine. So uh, this is, again, thinking about the rule feed little and often, very important for the foregut. For the hindgut, feed good quality food is very important. If you've got something that's going to be sitting in there for 24 hours, it needs to be of good quality. There's three main parts to the large intestine, the cecum, the small colon, and the large colon. There's no digestive enzymes secreted in the large intestine because this is a site of a different kind of thing going on, which is microbial fermentation. This occurs due to the presence of flora in the hindgut and you'll hear a lot about flora or bacteria but the flora actually is bacteria, fungus and protozoa. So there is a number of different organisms living in the hindgut all the time and they are doing something positive which is uh, they will be helping to digest food and a number of other things. The large intestine is the site of the absorption of water, the digestion of fiber. This is where the synthesis and absorption of the B vitamins takes place and the absorption of phosphorus. So synthesis means making. So the horse actually makes B vitamins in its system. Looking at the cecum, the cecum is similar to the appendix in the human. It's 1.2 meters long. It's sort of a blind sac. Uh, it has a capacity of 30 liters. It comprises 15% of the gastrointestinal tract. So again, I mentioned it was like a blind sac or a fermentation vat is the other thing that you will hear about. Byproducts are produced in the cecum, uh, and one is heat, and this is very important, especially in winter time. It helps to keep the horse warm, and this is why it's important to feed a lot of hay in the winter time, because this is where the hay is degraded, and part of the byproduct is heat, and so hay will keep your horse warm in the winter time. Gas is also produced, but the fiber in the hay will help to move the gas along, so it is expelled out the back end. Uh, if you don't have enough Hey, if you don't have enough food in the system, again, feeding little and often, then the movement of gas through the system will slow down and your horse could be susceptible to gas colic. So keeping the system full of food all the time helps to keep things moving, helps to keep the horse healthier. Uh, B vitamins like biotin are synthesized or made in the cecum. We also have the small colon, which is about three meters long. It's the site of the reabsorption of water. Some minerals and nutrients may be absorbed here as well. And then this is where the fecal bar balls start to form. And you come to the large colon. Large colon is where fiber is digested through micro microbial fermentation. So the microbes ferment, degrade, and ingest fiber. And in doing so, they will produce gases. So CO2 is one of the gases they produce, and then methane. Also, volatile folate. Volatile fatty acids, also known as VFAs, are produced here. They are fatty acids with a carbon chain of six carbons or fewer, and they can be created through the fermentation in the intestine. And there's a list of the fatty acids. Bacteria consumes fiber in the hindgut, and another term you will hear to another term you will hear used to describe these good bacteria is flora. But again, remember it's not just bacteria; it's bacteria, fungus, and protozoa. But when we think about bacteria, often we think about infections and bad things. It's good to know, or it's important to know, that we're looking at these bacteria, which are always present in the horse's system, and they do a very positive thing. They've got a very positive role in digestion and they should be there. The different bacteria present in the hindgut are each specific to a certain type of food stuff. That's why it's important to not make sudden changes to the food because you'll have some bacteria that break down certain types of food and then all of a sudden you replace that food with something else. We have bacteria without a job to do. We also have food that cannot be broken down because inadequate bacteria are present to break down this new food. So any changes to food needs to be taken gradually. It's also important to note, it, note that 
if your horse has <coughs> It's also important to note that if your horse has an infection somewhere in its body, that would be caused by bacteria, and you usually would give your horse antibiotics for that. But if you give long-lasting antibiotics or pen penicillin, it is going to be eradicating any bacteria in the system, so it could get rid of the good bacteria in the hindgut. And if that happens, then it's a good idea to put your horse on something called probiotics and that will replenish the bacteria in the hindgut because otherwise your horse can end up getting problems with its digestive tract and might get diarrhea. Um, this could lead to unthriftiness. So speaking more about the bacteria or the microbes, there is over 400 species present in the large intestine and they are there primarily to break down fiber. Uh, the pH in that area is 6.7 to 7. Uh, bicarbonate and phosphate salts are secreted into the large intestine to maintain this pH, coupled with the absorption of volatile fatty acids. So fiber is so important to your horse. Again, feed plenty of bulk food. That's one of our rules of feeding. The, sm the least you can feed horses is 50% of the diet. Uh, the least fiber you can feed a horse is 50% of the diet, but ideally 70 to 100% of the diet should be fiber. Fiber is necessary for many things. It stimulates peristalsis, so it makes those muscular contractions work that move food through the system. It heats the horse when it's cold. It gives a slow release energy. There's many things fiber does that are very important. Studies have also found that horses need a long stem fiber, so hay, or long grass as opposed to chaff, pellets, cubes, etc. Uh, in order to have the most efficient digestive system. So what sort of things should not be in the hindgut? The hindgut is not designed for high starch food, high sugar food, or high levels of fat. If there's too much fat, the fat can coat the fiber and that would make the fiber inaccessible for breakdown. If you have high starch or high sugar, your horse could potentially get problems like laminitis. Abrupt changes in food can cause things like reduced digestibility, colic, and laminitis. Finally, the end of the digestive system is the rectum and the anus. So the rectum is a holding tank or storage facility for fecal matter. And once formed into boluses, fecal matter is expelled through the anus. So here we have some questions for you to try. You can try and identify these parts of the di 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 you can try to identify these parts of the digestive tract and then we have some questions for you to answer as well. So I hope you enjoyed that. That was uh, number 2 in the equine nutrition series and it was the digestive system and I am Lisa Williamson. <laughs>